Hey everyone, hope you're having an absolute amazing week. Now, today we have a tutorial for you. It's been a while since we've done a tutorial, but this has been a real popular request. We're gonna take my bike and we're gonna send it off some drops. I'm gonna tell you guys how to build up from real small drops to doing absolutely huge ones because there's definitely some techniques which will help those landings feel a little bit softer. With the shows I do with drop and roll, I actually am the rider who ends up doing the 11 foot drop multiple times a day. So I've had plenty of time to perfect my technique with this. There's actually a technique that I stole off Danny McCaskill and it really does make these big drops feel a lot smaller and less harsh on your body and your bike. Before you start sending the drops, ideally you need to be really good at track stands so you can get ready and then really good on the back wheel so you can get right close to the edge. So if you are struggling with those, go check out my tutorials I've done on those, get those perfected and then you'll have a lot safer time doing these drops. Now, once you do start to get the big heights, this is where it gets really important that your bike is in good nick. You really don't want a chain snap when you're on the edge of a 10 foot drop. You really don't want your bars to snap when you're landing. So make sure your bike is in great condition if you plan to do some of these bigger drops. So let's not waste time, let's get into this. I've dragged along Ewan to get some cool slow-mo shots. So let's start doing some drops. I'm gonna start at the absolute beginning. So if you wanna move on to the next steps, Please see the chapters in the video time bar. Before we get onto big drops, it's important to practice safely. This means having a large area to ready yourself both side to side and forward and backwards. You want a situation that won't hurt you if you panic and need to bail or put a foot down. Likewise, it's a good idea to practice on a small step where you're less likely to go over the bars if the front wheel drops. Panicking and not releasing the brake can be common at the start, so making a safe scenario to learn is important. Now a lot of you might want to start by wheeling off the edge. This is a common way to drop, I still love wheelie drops, but today I'm going to be showing you only back hop drops. But if you're already comfortable back hopping, then there's no reason why you can't turn it into a little manual. Either way, the technique used to get on the back wheel isn't that important, as long as you're able to be controlled for the drop. Usually back hopping is the best way to get most control, so that's what I'll be focusing on. So like I mentioned, if you need help with back hops, please check out my tutorial on those. Get comfortable with them, and then come back. The better and more controlled you are with these, the better and safer the drops will be. For drops, it's important to know where your rear wheel is. For the best technique, you really want to aim to have your back wheel roll over the corner of the drop. This is why it's important to have good rear wheel control, so you can be precise and get as close to the edge as possible. I aim to have my rear axle directly above the corner when on the back wheel. A common mistake most new riders do, including me when I was younger, is not getting close enough to the edge and needing to do a big kick on the pedals. Taking off further back makes the drop bigger than it needs to be and ends up with a much harsher landing. Getting right on the corner makes the drop smaller and landing smoother. I'll get into more detail why once the drop gets a little bit bigger. But until then, practice getting as close to the edge as you can. You can look through your legs to see where the edge is, and once you feel you're in the right spot, keep the back brake locked and let the front wheel drop. If the drop is small enough, you can let the front wheel land first. At this stage, you're concentrating more on getting the feel for where the edge is. Eventually, you better feel the edge through the tyre and the pedals. Once you're comfortable getting precisely on the edge and lowering the front wheel, it's time to start releasing the back brake. On a small drop, I usually aim to land both wheels at the same time, as it can be smoother. There's often not even enough time to push the wheel down for a rear wheel landing anyway. Once the front wheel gets just below level, I release the back brake. If the rear wheel is quite far off the corner, you may not need to jab the pedals. The wheel will want to roll off and down anyway, but if you're slightly further back, a small jab is needed. Once the drops get bigger, a jab on the pedals is vital, as is getting your weight back. So this is a great time to experiment with different weight placements and pedal pressures. Just remember to lower the front wheel. That is absolutely vital once we go bigger. Hopefully you're now confident getting to the edge, lowering the front wheel and rolling the rear over the corner, as we're now going to make the drop a bit bigger, one that can't be rolled down. Although it is still possible to land front wheel first and not go over the bars, this is another advantage of getting close to the edge. It's more forgiving if you do drop the front wheel too far.
If you start too far back, you can't lower the front wheel as much, and like I mentioned earlier, it makes for a harsher landing and gives much more chance of going over the bars if you panic. Starting too far back with front wheel high versus starting on the edge and lowering the front wheel. Keeping the front wheel high maximizes the length of time you are falling. while lowering the front wheel minimizes the fall time. The lower you can go, the smaller the drop will feel. By lowering the wheel, I've effectively halved the height of this wall. At this height, I still prefer to land two wheels at the same time, unless I need to keep it on the rear wheel for whatever reason, maybe another drop or a gap. No matter if you land it to both wheels, rear wheel or front wheel, the takeoff is identical and at this height it's important to start getting your weight back as you drop the front. As the front wheel drops, I'm keeping my centre of mass above the rear hub. Too far back and the front wheel won't drop, and too far forwards and you'll struggle to avoid a front wheel landing. When the front wheel is at its lowest point, I release the back brake, gently jab the pedal and push down with my legs to bring my back wheel level with my front. Once my tyres touch down, I absorb the impact mostly with my legs and I take this even further by mostly absorbing with my right leg. My brakes are off and I let my right foot sink further, rotating my cranks. This is something I do with all heights of drops. It's a relic of when I broke my left foot and needed to find a way to make landing smoother to avoid the pain. On smaller drops I like to drop my heels as I'm lowering the front wheel and I also allow my cranks to ratchet back slightly. This isn't a forced motion that I'm specifically aiming to do but more of an end result of being relaxed. Many people have asked me how do I know how low to put my front wheel? I've been thinking and I don't think there's a clear point, but I'll try to explain. The exact point where the wheel is at its lowest can depend on a few things, like how much on the corner the tyre is, the further over the corner, the lower you can go. Even how long your arms are can be a determining factor. Longer arms means your weight can be further back and the more you can lower the wheel. Personally, I find the lowest point is just before it's too low for a jab on the pedals to be effective any lower than this point and I won't be able to push my back wheel down to catch up or overtake the front wheel. I got to know this lowest point by doing a thousand small drops to get the feel for it. I recommend finding a wall like this and practicing, ideally onto grass and seeing where your personal lowest point is. Don't go nuts though, do it safely by working in increments. Now if you want to land it on rear wheel and keep it on rear wheel, there's only a couple of differences. The setup is exactly the same, getting controlled on as close to the edge as possible and lowering the front wheel, just as I've explained. Only this time I don't drop the front wheel quite as much, I then keep my weight back as I kick off the drop and push my back wheel down slightly harder. I land with my back brake locked and absorb the impact equally with both legs. The reason I don't drop the front wheel further is because I need my back wheel to overtake it. If this was a bigger drop, there would be more time and space to allow me to drop the front lower, but on a wall this size, there just isn't. As soon as I release the brake and kick, I shift my weight back slightly and push down and forwards with my legs. This puts my weight slightly behind the axle now, as this accounts for my weight shifting forwards and above the axle again upon landing. I let my legs bend upon impact and allow myself to go into a sitting position. You feel like your bars are trying to be ripped from your grip, especially on bigger drops, so some strength is needed to keep hold of them. The further back you keep your weight, the easier it would be to keep you on the back wheel. This is another reason why starting further back is going to be harder. The impact will make holding onto the bars twice as hard and more likely to be ripped from your grip. I can't express enough the importance of being able to get controlled positioning right on the corner. Not only will it make the drops feel smaller, but allows you to drop from more awkward places or even rails. 
and is also why I don't suggest relying on wheelie drops. They're fine on totally flat objects, but will limit you if it gets more tech. I still do plenty of wheelie drops, so don't rule them out, just don't rely on them either. The bigger drops are almost always more controlled with a back hop start. Moving to a slightly bigger drop now, this one has a narrow takeoff, which is yet another reason why having control on the rear wheel is important. At this height it's still possible to land both wheels at the same time. All my previous tips still stand, only now the impact will be slightly higher. This is now starting to get to a height where dropping to rear is the softest landing. I'm able to lower the front wheel slightly lower now the wall is a little higher, but not quite as much as a two wheel landing. The reason why dropping to rear is a softer landing, despite not being to lower the front wheel as much as a two wheel landing, is because I can use more of my legs to take the impact. Here you can see that by landing rear wheel first I'm taking the initial impact with my strongest muscles which are in my legs, whereas the two wheel landing I'm having to take more impact with my arms which aren't as strong. The rear wheel landing also spreads out the time of the impact, and I'll go into more detail about this soon. You can see by how much lower I end up crouched on the two wheel landing how much harsher the impact was. Any higher than this and it makes sense to aim for a rear wheel landing only. Although this is still low enough not to be a disaster if you do land front wheel first, but your wrists and bike might complain. I briefly mentioned it earlier, but now the height's getting bigger, I'm looking through my legs at the corner to make sure I'm getting set up correctly. I use small hops with a locked brake to get millimetre perfect. Once I'm comfortable with my position, I start looking at my landing zone. I apply the back brake for the landing, but release it as soon as my front wheel hits. I'll explain more once we go a little bit higher. Notice that I still absorb mostly with my right slash forward foot. This is again to maximise the absorption and make it smoother. Let's take this higher, around 5-6 to six foot. This is getting to be a height where good technique really starts to help. Now it's certainly still possible to land both wheels at once with good technique, but I wouldn't recommend it. I did this as an example, and it wasn't very pleasant. So from this point onwards, I'll just be doing rear wheel landings. Now I've done a lot of chatting, but I haven't actually explained what really makes a landing smooth. Basically, we want to prolong the point of impact as long as possible, much like a parkour athlete will roll after a big drop rather than landing with a sudden stop. So when landing a drop, we really want to make that landing impact last as long as possible. That's why landing rear wheel first and rolling away afterwards helps rather than landing both wheels and coming to a complete stop. Here's an example of shortening the impact time by landing with lock brakes. It's noticeably harsher. This is the main ingredient that makes a smooth landing, a transfer of vertical momentum to horizontal. Landing with the brakes on stops your bike's momentum and all the energy has to be absorbed by your body making the landings a lot harsher. An effective way to make bigger drops smoother is to kick out a little when taking off. Adding some horizontal momentum at the start of the drop reduces the change in momentum upon landing, meaning less force for the body to absorb, just like a parkour style forward roll. If I do a drop where I don't lower the front wheel, don't kick out and do land with the brakes locked, you can see how much more impact is being transferred to my body. Both landings are absorbed by my legs and arms, but the lower front wheel and extra horizontal momentum definitely makes the right hand drop smoother, even though the height of the wall hasn't changed. In a best case scenario, you'd kick out doing a drop the same you would as a drop gap, but it can be a lot scarier and harder to control on the very big drops. Even without adding a huge kick, just adding a little extra combined with letting off the brakes will help smooth out the landing. Also you may notice I don't even cover the front brake at all, there's no need and I get more grip this way. Up to this point I don't feel there's been any radical advice, lots of people can drop this high smoothly. I think it's time to go higher, and this is where there's an additional technique specifically for the bigger drops. This is around 11 foot, see if you can spot the extra technique. Did you see it?
is all about the tuck. So everything is the same as the smaller drops. I control the bike to the edge, I spot the edge through my legs, I shift my weight back and lower the front wheel, I release the brake and kick. Only now, instead of pushing the rear wheel down, I wait. In the previous drops, I've been pushing the rear wheel down as soon as I kick. This is the most common way to drop, but it's not the smoothest way once the heights get bigger. Instead, I delay the push and stay tucked just for a moment. Only after this delay do I push my legs down in preparation for the landing. It's similar again to parkour, where athletes will stay tucked and only extend their legs to brace for impact. Same with skiers and snowboarders, they also stay tucked and only extend for landings. It doesn't matter if it's on foot, ski or bike, straining your legs as soon as you leave the edge will make for a harsher landing. Your legs are much better at absorbing landings if you push them down just before the impact. Some tucks are better than others, but even just a millisecond delay can make a big difference in reducing the harshness of the landing. As well as delaying the push, I also delay applying my back brake. This stops my cranks being locked in position and allows a little leeway to adjust my positioning if needed. I don't cover my front brake, this time to get maximum grip on the bars, which is why I also wear gloves for the big drops. Landing rear wheel first is great for prolonging the impact, but with all your weight dropping from this height, there's still a huge force pulling the bars forward, and it's easy for them to be ripped out of the grip of sweaty hands. This can also be pretty unforgiving on your shoulders, so be careful if you've got a history of dislocations. After the tuck and eventual push, the landing isn't that different to smaller drops, only you have to brace a little more to avoid your legs crumpling and sitting on the rear tyre. Sometimes I tuck to the side, but in this case, I was a little rusty due to the lack of shows and didn't manage to do that. I still land with the brake locked, and like the smaller drops, I release it as soon as the front wheel lands to allow my horizontal momentum to roll out and take the sting away. One thing to bear in mind for the big drops is it's quite easy to cut your knuckle on the brake lever. With these heights, the forces mean that even with stiff brakes, you end up pulling them nearly to the bar, and then your hand rotates as the bike changes angle, causing a bit of a cheese grater effect. I recommend adding some moldable Sugru rubber to the end of the blades to stop this from happening. Like Ewan has on his, this will definitely make the drops a little less painful. So there you go everyone, that is kind of my explanation on how to do the big drops. Once you do get onto the bigger heights, having that delay and then push the back wheel down makes such a big difference. Now if you're going to go out and try drops yourself or if you have been trying drops already, I can't emphasize enough the importance of starting small and honing your technique. Out of all the injuries I've had riding, one of my worst was messing up a big drop where I fractured a bone in my foot and it took about a year to recover from it. So seriously, if you're going to try these, start small and build up. I didn't go straight into the big drops. It's taken me 24 years to get this technique dialed. So take your time. That said, if you're out and you're progressing, you're sending the big drops, I'd love to see them. Tag me on Instagram with your attempts. And yeah, if they're really cool, if you've got good technique and you're doing it safely, I might just share it. Now I want to say a massive thanks to Ewan for helping film this one. If you want to see more clips from Ewan, then please consider supporting this channel, buying some merch like this. It helps me basically pay to have you and out for a day. Also consider hitting me up on Patreon as well for slightly longer videos released early. Thanks so much for joining me on this one. I hope it really helped you and I'll catch you next time. So have an amazing week everyone and I'll see you later. Bye bye. If you're new to the channel, I'll just get a little bit at the end here to give some love to all my Patreon folk. They're single-handedly supporting my channel and making it exist. So thanks so much to all these folk, including Amir Ronin, Laurie Patola, Andre Simpoka, Lyra1337, Choo Choo Cat, which is a great name, Daniel Wenger, JP Wallace, Jeff Lee, Tim Chimaki, and last but certainly not least, Johannes Hens. I hope everyone watching has an amazing week and I'll catch you next time. See you later everyone. Bye bye.